Uh, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on what five o'clock is. <laughs> uh, welcome to our uh, evening talk today. Um, it's good to see so many people, um, and it's good that uh, we can discuss here together uh, Andrew Port's newest book, Never Again. That's why we are here. My job is basically just to introduce uh, Andrew, uh, to welcome you, to say who I am and what all this is about. Uh, who am I? I'm Mario Daniels. I'm the moderator tonight. I'm a historian uh, working at the Deutschland Institute. But it's also the organization behind this event uh, tonight. Uh, I'm a historian by training. Uh, obviously German. You can hear that by my from my accent. <laughs> um, so. Um, as I said, my job is mainly to introduce our uh, dear guest, Andrew Port. I'm, I'm very, very pleased uh, to have Andrew here. He uh, comes all the way from Detroit. He arrived yesterday and said he's uh, pretty much jet lagged, um, but that's how it goes. So um, Andrew is a professor of history at Wayne State University in Detroit. Before uh, teaching at Wayne State, he taught as a lecturer at Harvard University and at Yale University, where he also earned his graduate and undergraduate uh, graduate degrees. He also worked as a project coordinator at the Office of Human Rights in Nuremberg, Germany. Andrew's, res uh, Andrew's research focuses on modern Germany, communism, state socialism, memory, and co comparative genocide uh, studies, labor history, and social protest. Uh, he has uh, written really a ton of articles and books, so please check them out. I will just mention a few of them. Uh, so, for example, uh, his uh, first larger book was uh, called Conf Conflict and Stability in the German Democratic Republic. It's also uh, translated into German uh, under the title Die Rätselhafte Stabilität der DDR. He uh, also is the uh, co-editor together with uh, Mary Fulbrook uh, of the book Becoming East German, Socialist Structures and Sensibilities After Hitler. And it's not just all about writing, it's also about uh, being a uh, great editor and doing service to the community. And so Andrew was also uh, uh, for quite a while the editor-in-chief of uh, Central European History uh, that's a flagship journal of uh, our field, and he was there the editor-in-chief between uh, 2014 and 2019. And he was also, before that, the review editor of German Studies Review. Um, but we are here uh, to learn more about his most recent book, even though I know there is another book in the pipeline, at least was what I read. Um, but the, the book we are talking to, uh, about tonight is called Never Again, Germans and Genocide of the Holocaust. It's uh, just out of uh, the press, oh, yeah, one year, roughly one year, uh, is, is it already out there? Um, and that's what we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, Andrew, thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Mario. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Hanko, uh, you, you as well. Thank you for organizing this. Um, you probably hear from my accent that I'm an American, so that, from Brooklyn, in fact, that you may not hear. Um, I am going to talk to you today about my new book, and uh, I'll, well, I guess I'm, I gave it a plug up there, but here you can see it live. If you want, we can talk during the question and answers about why some of the words are, are crossed out. Be happy to explain why that's the case. Okay. All right, let me begin by setting the stage. Sarajevo, several months after the signing of the Dayton Peace Accords that ended the war in Bosnia. Departing Serb forces in a final act of vengeful spite are setting aflame any structure still standing after their four-year-long siege of the Bosnian capital. Oh. 
yes, I think so. Yes, I'm talking about it. Be right back. Perfect. Okay. Dr. Rupert Neudeck spends the day with his son, Marcel, in a residential section of the city, breaking down doors, rushing into burning buildings to save the lives of elderly Muslims. The winter of 1996 is a cold one, and Dr. Neudeck taking yet another holiday with his immediate family in an active war zone. It's his third time there since news first broke about genocidal ethnic cleansing, mass rapes, and the setting up of concentration camps in the Balkans. That evening, the renowned German journalist and humanitarian sits quietly in a Bosnian friend's apartment reading, out of necessity by candlelight, a book about the Wehrmacht's occupation of Poland a half century earlier. Waking to the sound of explosions early the next day, Neudek looks out the window at all the destruction in the street below. Quote, that was precisely how I imagined early mornings in the Warsaw Ghetto. There are olfactory reminders of the past uh, as well. The road that, quote, smelled of genocide near Srebrenica, for instance, or the treacly foul stench of decaying corpses in Kigali. Yes, Rupert Neudek had also been in Rwanda during the genocidal uh, rampage of 1994, and that was no coincidence. Over the previous decade and a half, he had frequently been among the first German volunteers to arrive in trouble spots across the globe, organizing dozens of humanitarian missions from Southeast Asia to Southeast Europe. Most of this work was done on the side as a shoestring operation of sorts uh, during vacation or oh, good, uh, or on nights uh, and, and weekends with his wife, Kusta, whom you, you see here. Um, they did this usually in their modest townhouse on the outskirts of Cologne. That's where I visited Rupert Neudeck to find out why he had chosen to go to places like uh, Mogadishu instead of Mallorca, which, as most of you know, is a preferred vacation spot for most middle-class Germans. Um, go back to this photo. Neudeck cut a dashing figure with a gaunt, weathered face and neatly trimmed white beard. He had the air of a sea captain, though he was often mistaken for a medical doctor, an understandable error given all the medical assistance he had brought to Asia and Africa over the years. He was, in fact, a doctor of philosophy. Born in Danzig on the eve of World War II, Neudeck fled westward with his mother and younger siblings away from the Red Army in the waning months of the war. He studied law as a young man and served as a Jesuit novice. But then he decided to change course uh, and write a doctoral thesis on the political ethics of Sartre and Camus. After completing his degree, Neudeck took a different career path once again, beginning work in 1977 as a journalist and editor at West, Ger West Germany's premier public radio station. He and his wife, he later told me, were leading a perfectly bourgeois life at the time. That was his quote. Well, that all changed in February 1979 during a trip he took to Paris to collect material for a new book on Sartre. It was there that Neudeck met with the renowned French philosopher André Glucksmann, whom you see here on the right. Uh, Glucksmann was the first to speak with him at length about the dire situation of the so-called boat people in Southeast Asia. Their plight, these were people fleeing the communist uh, regime, in, but primarily in Vietnam, uh, taking to the seas to, to ramshackle boats to try to escape. Their plight had just broken as a major news story several months later. Que faites-vous? Glucksmann greeted Neudeck, not sure if it's the same cafe, but in the cafe where they, uh, where they met. What was he personally going to do about the refugees? 
Neudeck had similarly memorable meetings with Sartre himself, and also with Bernard Kushner, whom you see here on the right, the future foreign minister of France, who had founded Doctors Without Borders in 1971. Uh, the picture on the, on the, sorry, on the left here, um, it's an interesting photo. He, when he heard about the boat people, uh, he decided to charter a boat which was named a bateau pour le Vietnam, a boat for Vietnam. And he took to the South China Sea and rescued uh, many, many boat people. Well, inspired by the three men, in particular Kushner's activities uh, with the bateau pour le Vietnam, Neudeck returned to Germany intent on doing his part to help refugees from the region who were stranded and dying on the high seas. That decision had a great deal to do with Neudeck's own personal history. On January 30th, 1945, during their flight from Danzig, he and his family arrived in the Baltic port city of Gotenhafen, where they saw a large cruise ship in the harbor, the Wilhelm Gustloff. Originally built in the mid-1930s for the Nazi leisure movement, Strength Through Joy, or Kraft durch Freude, <clears throat> The ship was now being used to evacuate German officials, civilians, and refugees from the advancing Soviet army. Neudeck's mother did not have tickets for the Guslov, and as Neudeck later insisted, she wouldn't have taken a, quote, luxury ship for Nazi bigwigs anyway, and they wound up on board a coal steamer instead. That was our savior, he later told me. Later that day, a, sub sub a Soviet submarine sank the Guslov, and thousands of its passengers drowned in the freezing waters of the Baltic. The news quickly reached him and his family, and horrific images of the disaster left an indelible impression on the five-year-old. That was why Neudeck believed drowning by, uh, death by drowning became such an important archetype in his life and a major motivation for his later relief efforts. Well, thanks to a flood of private donations, Neudeck was able to charter and outfit a ship of his own, a decommissioned Dutch freighter, the Cap Anamur, which you see here on the right. By the summer of 1982, the ship had rescued almost 10,000 boat people, most of whom uh, were later allowed to seek refuge uh, in the Federal Republic. Now, Neudeck's group became best known at the time for his perilous undertaking. Uh, and this undertaking on the South China Sea really was indeed perilous. I spoke with one of the volunteers, and she um, she told me that there was a threat of, you know, and, and actually instances of pirates coming up to their ship and demanding money and other things. At any rate, the, his group became uh, you know, best known for the Kappa no more, but its activities were not limited to saving the lives of those fleeing by sea. Neudeck also sent teams of German doctors and nurses to the Thai-Cambodian border to assist Cambodians, uh, Cambodian refugees who had just survived the uh, genocide of the Khmer Rouge. On the photo on the left, you see Neudeck hoisting a, a sign announcing the start of this, this uh, uh, refugee uh, camp that he, he helped to... Uh, he helped to um, uh, provide aid to. And on the right, you see him on the Cap Anamor, very similar to Kushner. Here he is with two young children, who, uh, boat children, whom he helped save. Well, the work of those people who, who worked in this uh, camp, in this refugee camp on the Thai uh, Cambodian border, they relied on the generosity of private citizens and German celebrities, including the Nobel Prize winning novelist Heinrich Böll. Uh, equally essential was the engagement of hundreds of West Germans who volunteered for stints of four to eight weeks. And this included one nurse from Bonn, the then uh, West German capital, who decided to volunteer instead of taking a ski vacation that year. And she later explained that she had worked for five weeks there, quote, under the most primitive conditions, her, her words. Well, to be effective, Neudeck believed, volunteers had to live together with the people, without any showers or other niceties, experiencing hardship and physically sharing their everyday reality is crucial for aid work. That was a direct quote. Uh, one detects here, I think, 
the Christian impulse behind this former Jesuit novice's activities and perhaps his scholarly interest in existential philosophy as well. Um, I had to think of that quote when I was doing some research in the East German archives, because in the book I also discuss how the uh, GDR officials responded. And the, the counterpart to, the, to this story, to Neudeck, wanting to live with the people without showers or other niceties, uh, I found a, a, a document by East German officials complaining that it was, um, I think the word in German was unzumutbar. Um, um, it, uh, help me here. I used to speak English fluently. Uh, uh, sounds, sounds good. Sounds all right. Okay, I was trying. No, I know. I, I was I was looking for the English translation, but but any unbearable. unbearable. Yeah. It was unbearable uh, because it wasn't right that the Ger East German doctors and nurses they sent had to be in uh, places that had no air conditioning, and I did not know that air conditioning was. I know it's a big thing in my country. I didn't know that about um, East Germany. Anyway. <laughs> It's about as political as I'll get tonight. Okay. <clears throat> a childhood trauma, a Catholic upbringing, and a fortuitous visit to Paris in the winter of 1979, these were the three main influences that first spurred Rupert Neudeck into action. And when I sat with him decades later in a living room filled to the brim with foreign art and other artifacts he had collected from abroad over the years, the conversation eventually turned to why his volunteers did what they did. They had endless motivations, he suspected, but there was most certainly a very great collective willingness on the part of his fellow Germans to do, quote, more for humanitarian issues than all other European nationalities. And that most certainly has to do with the past. But which past exactly? His own main motivation, he readily acknowledged, had been his traumatic experiences as a child refugee. But what about the suffering the Germans had caused and not the suffering they had earlier experienced themselves? Well, Nazi crimes against humanity, and the Jews in particular, he believed, had a, quote, powerful role, adding that his organization's activities were a, quote, semi-conscious attempt to compensate somehow for this past, to portray Germany, quote, a little bit differently in the world. And when it came to humanitarian actions, German volunteers always did more than our other Europeans, he insisted, because they didn't want to be surpassed in their efforts. This was, after all, one area where they were, quote, allowed to be on top of the world. I don't know if my younger daughter is watching from Ann Arbor, um, <clears throat> but she's the reason why I bring this along. She, uh, it, it has a built-in straw, so she said my hand shakes sometimes, and a glass is just not very good. So thank you, Rebecca, if you're watching. And go to bed right after. All right. Um, <clears throat> Several weeks after meeting with Rupert Neudeck, I spoke with Helmut Schmidt about his government's response to the Cambodian genocide. The former West German chancellor had come under attack in the late 1970s for not doing enough to uh, help the refugees in Indochina. What happened tens of thousands of miles away in Southeast Asia didn't threaten West Germany in any way, he bluntly told me. And the genocide in Cambodia, quote, didn't concern us. Uh, almost all Asian countries committed acts that, quote, violated morality, uh, he added. But this was simply not, quote, our affair. And I was very uh, struck by the way he said our affair in German. He said, das, das ist nicht unser Bier. That's not our beer. <clears throat> if, we, if we have time and, get, uh, and, and don't have enough Q&A questions. I have a, several anecdotes from that interview. I'd be happy to share later, but all right. The Federal Republic's vital interests came before moral and humanitarian considerations, he continued. In the realm of foreign affairs, those interests, uh, those interests consisted almost exclusively of the existential threat posed by Soviet nuclear weapons stationed in Eastern Europe. Foreign Minister Hans Dietrich Genscher 
whom he referred to, by the way, in the interview was um, um, mine, Alson Minister. He was my, and Cole borrowed him, he told me. Uh, De Genscher had a similar take at the time, annoyed by repeated requests for information about the Cambodian genocide, right? Word was slowly uh, sickering out. Uh, he wanted to know why some West German politicians were placing, quote, so much value on this issue anyway. Well, whatever reservations the two men may have had, their country would take in almost 14,000 refugees from Indochina by the spring of 1980. Of course, that may not sound like a lot, especially when you think about recent uh, migration numbers in Germany, but that was the highest number among Western nations without special ties to the region, like the United States and France. Why did the Germans do this? Well, by way of explanation, uh, West German officials pointed to their own country's bitter experiences involving mass flight and expulsion. Like Rupert Neudeck and his family, some 12 million ethnic Germans fled or were expelled from Germany's eastern territories in the mid and late 1940s. Another 2.7 million fled communist East Germany between 1949 and 1961, the year the Berlin Wall was built. Foreign Minister Genscher himself had fled the GDR as a young man. At any rate, uh, and, and that was something he would emphasize in, in talks with foreign dignitaries when it came to you know, this issue of how many uh, refugees the Federal Republic was willing to, uh, to take in. Well, all in good, but as the number of refugees skyrocketed worldwide beginning in the late 1970s, and with it, the number of people applying for asylum in the Federal Republic, the initial willingness to welcome these poor souls fleeing war-torn regions quickly gave way to angry resentment about foreign fraud supposedly taking advantage of German generosity. Two contrasting sets of responses then to one of the world's most horrific genocides since the systematic murder of the European Jews in the 1940s. Copious concern and bountiful largesse on the one hand, apparent indifference and acrimonious backlash on the other. Responses that prefigure in many ways developments in today's Federal Republic. Since 2015, the xenophobic far right has enjoyed a political resurgence there in the wake of Chancellor Angela Merkel's controversial decision to welcome more than a million refugees from Africa and the Middle East. Both developments drew global attention to Germany, but neither the Chancellor's largesse nor the backlash it brought in its wake should have been a surprise, at least not uh, to those familiar with the story of what Germans have talked about and done in response to genocide and other mass suffering in foreign lands since 1945. That is the subject of my book. Now, I can think of few foreign policy issues more vital than the international community's response, or lack thereof, to state-sponsored mass murder, despite, since 1945, the oft-repeated injunction, never again. German reactions to genocide are important because they provide us with a much better understanding of how and why powerful states have decided whether to intervene in humanitarian trouble spots around the globe. And given Germany's own intimate relationship with the so-called crime of crimes, its responses to genocide in foreign lands are, I think, especially intriguing. Just as important, they vividly demonstrate how domestic debates and political interests influence such decisions. Cognitive factors were especially important here, despite what some um, political scientists who call themselves realists will, 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 will tell you. Um, cognitive factors played an important role here. Values and beliefs, culture, morals, emotions, all of which are shaped by historical experience and perceived lessons of the past. Well, that was especially true of post-war Germany, where an especially intense culture of remembrance about the Third Reich had been cultivated in its western half since the 1960s and about the Holocaust since the late 1970s. Uh, 
East Germany uh, is an even more, well, maybe in some ways simpler, but a different story. And if there are questions, I can, I'm glad to talk about memory politics in, the, in both states during this period. Now, there are, of course, few countries more haunted by the darker aspects of their recent history than Germany. Almost 80 years after the end of World War II, barbaric crimes, uh, the barbaric crimes committed by the Nazis continue to cast a long shadow at home and abroad, coloring perceptions and self-perceptions of the country and its people. Yet the story of how Germans managed to put their violent, genocidal past behind them in practice and create a stable and prosperous democracy reluctant to use force and committed to the defense of human rights, that is an equally important and gripping tale. If the driving question about the years prior to 1945 had long been a disheartening one, right? where did Germany go wrong, the period since the war presents a different puzzle. How and why did Germany go right? I don't mean politically. Um, my book tackles these questions in a roundabout way, using German responses to mass murder in other lands to understand how the weight of the past shaped beliefs and influenced actual behavior in the post-war present. I consciously chose this, this indirect approach, German reactions to foreign genocide, because I hope to present a less, um, a less stilted picture of German memory work. Now, there are many abstract theories about the nature and significance of collective memory. Um, I'm not going to talk about them tonight, because to my mind, its true importance lies in its consequences, in its tangible effects on actual attitudes and actions. And that's why I focus in my book less on solemn statements by high-level officials, which is the usual approach to uh, German Vergangenheitsbewältigung, right? that very long word at the top there, coming to terms with the past, uh, and more on the concrete acts that came in response to reports of foreign genocides decades after the final solution. To get at these issues, I specifically look at German responses to the three infamous genocides that took place in Cambodia, Bosnia, and Rwanda from the mid-1970s to the mid-1980s. Uh, I'd like to add a, uh, a, a quick disclaimer. The mass slaughter that took place in those three countries were not necessarily the quote-unquote worst post-war genocides. I mean, how do you even measure or compare suffering and cruelty. But they did receive, arguably, the most international attention. And that makes the available source material especially rich. In other words, that's why I chose these three. Geographic diversity was an equally important consideration. Right, Each took place in a different part of the world. And as a result, Germany's uh, historical and contemporary relationships with each country varied considerably. That's important because it lets me explore how German responses to foreign genocide were shaped by political, geopolitical, and diplomatic calculations, economic interests, racial and ethnic prejudices, and last but not least, historical burdens, including Germany's relatively short-lived legacy of colonial empire. Uh, something that I think most Germans were uh, probably not even aware of in, 19, in the 1990s when Rwanda uh, took place. And I think it helps explain why Germans did so much to aid Bosnians, and there are other reasons, of course, uh, to aid Bosnians at the very time they failed to lift a finger to help the Tutsi in Rwanda. That, that, that shot at Germany's reaction. Let me just, I mean, given how my country and every other Western country responded, I'm certainly not singling the, um, the, 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 the Germans out there. But what I did find very interesting is that its colonial past played almost no role in media coverage at the time. Right? Um, that issue of you know, Germany's colonial past, thanks to a number of 
uh, of scholars has gotten increasing attention in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, you know, we now know about or learn more about the Herrero and 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 um, and, and Nama. In any event, um, working on the period from the 1970s to the 1990s is significant. It's why I chose those years, because they lay bare evolving reactions to mass murder during a period of drastic change, from the height of the Cold War when two German states still existed, to the period following unification, from a time when few Germans showed much interest in the Holocaust, to one when few topics generated as much public attention as the genocide of the European Jews. The precise timing of the three genocides is also significant. By chance, a conspicuous uh, spike in interest about the fate of the European Jews coincided with the genocide in Cambodia. In fact, the Khmer Rouge were driven from power the very month that the American miniseries Holocaust aired on West German uh, television in January 1979. Most of you here, I won't go into this, although I'm glad to say something to the discussion. The showing of the Holocaust uh, miniseries was a uh, sensational uh, media event that initiated a public fixation on the final solution at precisely the point in time when first-hand details about the carnage in Cambodia began to emerge. And it fundamentally influenced German responses to the crimes of the Khmer Rouge. In turn, it affected how Germans spoke and thought about their own past. And I think that became especially clear during the infamous Historikerstreit, um, or historian's quarrel, right? That fierce a uh, public debate in the mid-1980s between German uh, progressives and conservatives about the uniqueness and, and causes of what now increasingly became known as the Holocaust. Um, that's why I include the photo on the right. That's a book that was published by two um, uh, German journalists who, who worked for the Spiegel. The idea that, say, five years earlier, if an event like that had happened, they certainly would not have called it Holocaust in Cambodia. Uh, her contribution to that is very interesting. She published a two-part series in the Spiegel where she talked about the fate of a single um, Cambodian family. And uh, I think there are 88 names and 44 of them are blacked out. You know, the family. So I asked her, I said, were you inspired by uh, the, the miniseries Holocaust? I didn't get the answer I wanted, which was yes. She said she hadn't seen it, but I thought the parallel was interesting. There are other good reasons, I think, for beginning in the 1970s. This was the, the decade when global interest in human rights reemerged. It was also when the worldwide flow of refugees reached unprecedented proportions, a development that had a major impact on German responses to foreign genocide. It stimulated humanitarian efforts to relieve mass suffering abroad, but it also stoked fears at the same time about letting in, quote, uh, too many foreigners, especially, quote, unquote, bogus ones, uh, supposedly coming to Germany for purely venal reasons. Uh, few issues have enlivened and politicized public debate of late as much as immigra immigration, and not just in the Federal Republic, as we Americans and I would add, as you Dutch are well aware. My book draws attention to two contradictory impulses then since the 1970s. Rampant fear, anger, and resentment about overburdening and uh, awful German word, überfremdung, excessive foreignization, and a widespread desire, even compulsion for some because of Germany's past to help the less fortunate. A look at German reactions to genocide during the first half of the 1990s takes the story into the period after the Cold War, and thus into a much different geopolitical context. Uh, Germany's unexpected unification in 1990 not only marked the end of four decades of division, but also transformed the country's international position. The restoration of full sovereignty meant that the country now had greater freedom for maneuver, as well as greater international responsibilities. And its responses to the twin genocides in Bosnia and Rwanda show how this 
dramatically reconfigured the country's foreign policy as well as its relationship with a now more distant past. Now, as many of you in the looking around, probably only about half of you, but as, as many of you here will remember, the Federal Republic's change standing in the world gave uh, rise to a great deal of anguish and, and hand-wringing at the time, right? Would unified Germany remain a quote-unquote tamed power or revert to its dangerous and destructive ways of yore? Had the country truly learned the lessons of its history? Well, the question of what those lessons even were became a great source of vexed debate in the shadow of genocidal atrocities in the Balkans, where unified Germany faced its most significant challenge abroad since unification, whether to participate in joint military efforts aimed at stopping genocide and other human rights abuses on foreign soil. This confronted Germans with difficult choices that threw into disarray the old post-war consensus on foreign policy and the non-use of force. Even renowned pacifists, pacifists like Joschka Fischer, the former uh, student radical who was you know, beating up policemen in Frankfurt in the early 70s, later became uh, foreign minister, and started also wearing Armani suits and running, running um, marathons. If that sounds a little nasty, there's a, there's a person, I, I, I'm happy to tell you about a, an anecdote, a, a, uh, another anecdote, but a, a uh, Joschka Fischer anecdote uh, from several months ago, um, if we have time during the discussion. All right. And at, any rate, uh, at any rate, Fisher came down on the side of humanitarian intervention. And as foreign minister in the late 1990s, he presided over Germany's first actual combat mission abroad since 1945 in Kosovo. And in support, he again in 1999 invoked the specter of genocide, as he did uh, at first in, um, in uh, Bosnia. My own initial interest in German responses to foreign genocide came in the summer of 1992, when I first heard reports that Serbs had set up concentration camps in Bosnia. I was living in Germany at the time, and I vividly recalled television images of emaciated men with shaved heads standing behind barbed wire. The images resonated for obvious reasons, and I distinctly recall thinking that this could not be true, that there could not be concentration camps in Europe in 1992. I also recall a great deal of skepticism in Germany as well, as policymakers and public figures in the media struggled to come up with a quote-unquote proper uh, response. Never again Auschwitz, or never again war. Those two slogans encapsulated the harrowing dilemma that many Germans faced after learning about the genocidal atrocities taking place in Bosnia. Should their country, because of its past, stand by and do nothing in response to reports of yet another genocide, this time only a, drive's way, a, a day's drive from Berlin? Or should they participate in international interventions intended to stop the mass slaughter by force? The story of how Germans confronted their past and the concrete consequences that that had in response to mass atrocities abroad, it's a highly relevant story, I think, that's arguably as worthy of our interests as the darker topics in modern uh, German history. Don't misunderstand me. The focus on Nazism and the Holocaust is, of course, understandable. But the attention my book devotes to the admirable and, and often, often uplifting actions of Germans from all walks of life, I think it offers countries with difficult pasts, um, again, including my country, including, well, if you're, uh, whatever country most of you are here are from, uh, I, you know, we can all learn for this, from this. Um, it, it offers a, a master class of sorts and coming to terms with the more sinister aspects of their own history, especially at a moment when many seem to fear in my country that we might be going the same way uh, Germany did in the early 1930s. Well, Looking to the Germans for inspiration, uh, it's an idea you might be familiar with. Susan Nyman has written about this in, in, uh, 
in, in uh, a book called Learning from the Germans. I'm going to say a few words about that later on. Um, Looking to the Germans for inspiration reinforces a widespread tendency to see post-war Western Germany as a success story. Now, there are good reasons for questioning that simple but uplifting narrative, which downplays the less sanguine aspects of Germany's post-war history. Endemic racism and sexism, for example, environmental degradation, continuing wealth disparities. Still, even with those caveats in mind, and even when not measured against the terrible, horrible foil of Nazi Germany, the Federal Republic, I think, was indeed a success story, a place where Germans effectively put their violent, once genocidal past behind them. And the responses to genocide in foreign lands are an untold aspect of that story. Now, it's true that those responses didn't do much to prevent genocide. They were more reactive than active, even again when it was taking place in their own backyard in the Balkans. And despite their obligations as an early signatory of the 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. But my research doesn't take a, a normative or, or a prescriptive approach, right? So not a, a j'accuse of Germans uh, for what they should have done in the face of genocide. Some of you may be familiar with Samantha Power's book, uh, Problem from Hell, which she talks about American responses to, uh, or lack thereof, responses to genocides after 1945. And she takes a very clear political uh, position on it. I mean, she's very critical and condemns the United States for, for not having um, acted. As many of you may also know she later became the ambassador to the UN under Obama, uh, published her memoirs, and after actually having a position of, of um, you know, power in the government, modified her views uh, somewhat. I say that as an aside. Um, my book explores, instead of taking this kind of normative approach, my book explores instead the parameters of the possible for post-war Germany, given the weight of its past and its own international position, both before and after 1989. Hardly anyone, least of all the Germans themselves, would have wished or expected uh, East or West Germany to take military action abroad. That changed dramatically after unification, and, and that transformation, along with the stormy domestic debates unleashed by the decision to intervene militarily in Bosnia, those are central themes in my book. And they remain important uh, themes, of course, today, especially since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, that last point uh, is an important one, this idea that no one expected Germans to take military action abroad. Why? I think because it moves the conversation beyond moralistic condemnations of an action, beyond the writing of history as what I like to call politics by other means. For most countries, grand actions involving military force are extremely difficult or simply not possible. And that's why I focus instead on what German officials and citizens could and did do short of sending actual combat troops, uh, providing various forms of humanitarian assistance, for example, welcoming large numbers of refugees to Germany. Um, just a, a, a reminder that during the war in Bosnia, the Germans took in more than double the number of, of uh, refugees from former Yugoslavia than all of uh, the other countries in Europe put together. Something also worth keeping in mind, given, um, you know, again, I'm not, I'm tr I will remain as unpolitical as possible here, but I, I you know, given recent claims about uh, Germany coming down very hard um, on, on pro-Palestinian protests. Um, and we can, of course, certainly talk about that afterwards. Um, but this kind of unnuanced idea of Germans being anti-Muslim, uh, I mean, I've certainly experienced it myself. I'm not trying to downplay this. But their treatment of the Muslims who came from Bosnia in the early 1990s was, by all accounts, very, very positive. Now. These were, in the eyes of the Germans and in the eyes of the Bosniaks themselves, westernized Muslims, right? They 
smoke cigarettes and wore uh, you know, sweatshirts, but, but still, you know, I, I, I think it's important to keep in mind, given you know, many of the criticisms that have recently been, uh, been made. Okay, so. Reports of mass atrocities go to Germans into action in short, and what they did went far beyond high-sounding speeches meant to atone for past atrocities. And that's significant because it reveals a great deal about German uh, values, mentalities, and quote-unquote lessons learned after 1945. Lessons that should be of interest, again, to Americans and others, uh, searching for effective ways to reckon with the more sordid aspects of their own country's past. What struck me repeatedly about German reactions to foreign genocide is that the legacy and lessons of the Third Reich and the Holocaust were not at all clear cut. The difficult choice between never again Auschwitz or never again war, um, I think that captures just how ambivalent the burden of history could be. And in fact, as my book shows again and again, Germany's violent past could be and was used to draw diametrically opposed uh, conclusions about the quote unquote proper response to reports of foreign genocide. Uh, those who tended to see Germany's hands tied because of its history, who spoke passionately of a quote duty to nonviolence because of Nazi atrocities, they met with equally heartfelt counter arguments by those who pointed to their country's past as an injunction to act. As Foreign Minister Klaus Kinkel told colleagues in June 1995, and this is just two weeks before the genocidal massacre at Srebrenica, quote, we have a political and moral duty to assist precisely in light of our history. It was, after all, the Allies who, using military force, by the way, freed us from the Nazi dictatorship. If the Third Reich has taught us anything, it's perhaps that there are no easy answers to these questions and debates. But my book draws attention to something just as important. The mass suffering caused by Germans was not necessarily the past that mattered most to them. As Rupert Neudeck's story teaches us, the suffering that Germans experienced themselves, their profound sense of victimhood, could be equally motivational. And so could perceptions of political and even economic self-interest. In fact, my book shows how these debates about proper responses to genocide were used over and over and over again to score points against domestic political rivals, with progressives accusing conservatives of only supporting humanitarian military uh, intervention in hopes of one day restoring Germany's status as a, as a Großmacht, as a, as a great power. Those on the right responded in kind, asking why the left had remained so silent as the Cambodian communist butchered millions. What these debates also show is that most conservatives confronted and took responsibility for Germany's past as seriously as their opponents on the left. And that's an important and often overlooked legacy of the progressive political um, upheavals of the late 1960s, when Nazi crimes became for almost all Germans, regardless of political outlook, the measure of all things evil. The willingness, and you'll see in a second why, why I'm uh, focusing on this, the, the willingness of conservative Germans also to countenance their country's difficult past and draw important lessons from it distinguishes them from many of their counterparts in my country, in the United States, where many conservatives seem disinclined to confront, much less take responsibility for the history and legacy of American racism. But it should also serve as a sign of encouragement that such efforts need not be politically exclusive or one-sided, and neither should remorse. There's perhaps another important lesson here for an American audience, what to avoid when confronting the past. And this will be the last point I'll make this evening. After two decades of deafening silence about the Holocaust, the pendulum swung in the opposite direction beginning in the late 1960s, producing an almost um, obsessive 
public preoccupation with the dark side of Germany's past. That eventually produced an angry backlash, even on the part of those who can in no way be considered to be apologists for the Third Reich. I refer to Germans, even on the left, who complain that the political and moralistic use of negative memories about the Nazi past has been used as a, as a high-handed uh, moral cudgel against political enemies. Well, my work shows how those very disputes dominated public discussion about genocide in foreign lands, fueling accusations that foreign atrocities were being used to somehow relativize Germany's uh, er own earlier crimes. This often played out in the very language, the way that, uh, very way that language was used. Heated debates about the appropriateness of referring to Serb prison compounds in Bosnia as concentration camps, and so I'm always quick to put up the scare quotes. Um, those debates were just one example of this. One that had eerie reverberations, by the way, uh, in recent debates in the United States about the use of that very charged term to describe holding facilities for immigrants on the U.S. southern border. The point is that Americans can indeed learn from the Germans about confronting their own checkered past, um, which, again, is something that Susan Nyman believed four years ago. She's changed her opinion a little bit in the last few months. She now thinks that German memory work has gone haywire. <laughs> At any rate, um, I would say this. Those lessons, the lessons we can learn from the Germans are ambivalent, right? Um, again, as I said before, the backlash in Germany against too much memory has largely been a defiant response to, to style and approach, to excessive moralizing and finger pointing, to the instrumental use of memory to attack one f one's foes across the aisle. The need to achieve a balance between too little and too much, to strike a, a proper tone that doesn't give uh, rise to nasty recriminations and indignant backlash, that I think is perhaps the most important lesson the Germans can teach us. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Andrew, for this fascinating talk. Uh, we have quite a bit of time for Q&A, so if you have questions, that's your moment. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Ernest. Just keep the uh, Redecker if you want the full name. So it, uh, I come from my family comes from Hanover, but we're Dutch. Okay. Um, I've been studying on and off uh, the Shoah, as I would prefer to call it, for maybe 50 years and German history for 50 years. And in recent years, since about 10 years, I become irritated with uh, the term Holocaust. I prefer Shoah. And if you use Holocaust, uh, why not say the European Holocaust? Because Obviously, the place where, uh, where it took place, everything was Europe, the perpetrators were Europeans, the uh, victims were Europeans, the collaborators were Europeans, the bystanders were Europeans, and those that resisted it were Europeans. And my idea has been growing after reading an awful lot about it, is that um, by making it the Holocaust, the kind of transcendental evil for the whole world, you, what you're actually doing in Europe, especially in Germany and Austria, the main perpetrators, is a kind of schuld and lustung, uh, uh, driving away the European responsibility for the, the Shoah and making it a problem of the whole world, including, say, the Indians in South America, the loyal subjects of the King of Tonga in the Pacific, the Eskimos in the North. Sorry, is there a question in there? Yes, yes. my question in this is, um, what would the professor think of uh, renaming, rebranding the Holocaust, which is a European thing, into European Holocaust. Likewise, we speak of the Cambodian genocide and the Rwandan genocide. So make it a European Holocaust so that everybody in the world knows that Arabs are not responsible for it, let alone Palestinians. That's my question. Thank you. Uh -huh. 
Well, I, <clears throat> what was I saying about avoiding indignant backlash? No, kidding. Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I, this is a topic that's come up a lot recently because of you know, claims of you know, debates about what's going on in the Middle East and what's um, proper word usage and, and not, right? So uh, the word genocide recently has been thrown around a lot. Um, and, you know, one, one can have different types of discussions about what that means, right? There's the, the popular sense of genocide, and most of us probably still tend to associate that with the, you know, with the industrial mass murder at, at Auschwitz. Um, but there's also a, um, there's a more emotional meaning of, of the word genocide and also of Holocaust. And when you start to use that to describe other mass atrocities, um, I feel ambivalent. I can certainly see the reason why, and I don't think that that word Holocaust was first used to describe what happened in the 40s to the, um, uh, to the Jews, right? It's this biblical term that right, goes back. Um, but it's so closely associated with it that in a sense, and I'm choosing my words here very carefully, and again, I'm not saying you're doing this, but I think in the United States we talk a lot about microaggressions, right, using certain language that irks traditionally persecuted uh, groups. Using words like holocaust or, or genocide to describe what's going on in the Middle East now strikes me. That's what I find problematic. Not so much the legal definition. One can have a rational discussion to the extent that one can have a rational discussion about something as awful as genocide. But we can have a rational discussion about whether or not actions there constitute that. But again, it's, it, it seems to be a lot to have a lot to do with the sense of intent, of motivation. Why is somebody using that term? in the middle, and then here in the front. Yes, thank you. Thank a lot for your uh, presentation. It's a fascinating talk, and I look forward uh, to read your book. Um, you, you were uh, very clear in, um, um, uh, well, arguing for complexities and ambivalencies, like we academics always like to do. And I would like to invite you on two points to make perhaps a somewhat more clear statement about your own narrative. Um, the first one is, uh, I think you very convincingly showed that, uh, f speaking for Germany, it's not only, well, the awareness of own guilt um, uh, that um, motivated Germans to action on other areas of the world, perhaps genocide, but also the awareness of their own suffering at the end of the war mainly. But you left it very unclear if there is a kind of um, can you make a kind of uh, how important were these these both well these influences like the awareness of well uh, um, uh, at adversities in German history or or these sufferings? So I remember, for example, uh, in the Iraqi War that the Bombay of Baghdad um, kind of resonated with German suffering stories from the bombing of Dresden, which is of course victimization. Uh, on the other hand, um, the Kosovo War. 1999, um, very impressive was this, this image of the Hufeisen plan. Uh, I don't know how trans to translate this in, in, uh, in English, um, which refers, of course, to genocide and to German uh, uh, address, um, well, guilt in the past. So can you, can you say something about the priorities in these references to the past? Because I always would like, I would assume that it's mainly the story of guilt and the guilt that uh, motivated uh, German political action abroad. That would be the first question to, to differ differentiate a bit again. The other one is, um, uh, well, I had another one. Uh, <laughs> but I forgot. I could talked start so much responding about to the, the first, first one. one. It might be enough. So. Okay. okay. Um. 
if I understood the question this time, um, I, I, I think that Germans own suffering as, as, as victims, right, in the, late, in the mid and late 40s. Um, that had the greatest influence on debates about refugees and asylum issues, right? Um, and I'm talking now about the early 90s in particular, about Bosnia, but, but also when it came to Cambodia. Um, when it came to mass atrocities, ethnic cleansing in Bosnia, right? Uh, there, the comparison was automatically with, um, well, with more than just, you know, the Third Reich, but with the Holocaust. And, and much of the language that was used um, was either by chance or intended, I suppose, in most cases intended to evoke that kind of um, imagery and association. So, is that? Yeah. Okay. And and I would say it's an, it's 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 an important distinction to make, in particular that one, because when um, when some scholars and public intellectuals talk about how the Germans have dealt with their past, um, there's not much differentiation between, say, East and West Germans. And very often when it comes to, the, and this is true, I think, for both of those states, um, one has to differentiate also between how one talks about the Third Reich unto itself and how one talks about the Holocaust. So, for example, there is a great deal of talk in West Germany and East Germany about the Third Reich beginning in the late 50s and the 60s, uh, about the Holocaust, that really only starts in the late 70s and 19, uh, 1980s. So. Well, I sort of had a question about guilt also, because, of course, uh, so much work has been done about perpetrators and how difficult it is for them to express guilty feelings, <laughs> especially in the in the post uh, World War II context. Um, I'm just wondering when that feeling of guilt shifted into a feeling of what you talk about as the idea of compensation or the idea that there's something that jo Germany maybe owes to the world in these kinds of genocidal conflict situations. Um, I'll try to give as brief an answer as, as, as possible. Um, <clears throat> You know, the, the, I think the common narrative is that Germans, West Germans, didn't speak in, about the Third Reich until the 68ers came along and um, made it an issue. It's actually not true. I mean, the, the first decade or so after the end of the decade and a half, until the late 50s, uh, there's very little discussion of, of um, German crimes, right? Not talked about. It begins to change in the late 50s. There's a series of anti-Semitic incidents across Germany. These are when the first trials are beginning, right? Um, the Eichmann trial in, in, in Israel, then the, uh, the Frankfurt Auschwitz trials in, in, in West Germany itself. So there is, you know, gradually more discussion of the Third Reich. But again, this 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 mention, this this focus on the Holocaust that doesn't begin until 79, 80. Um, the 68ers invoked the systematic murder of the Jews by comparing themselves to them, by saying, we're the new Jews. They refer to, you know, receiving Zonderbehandlung and, and, and things like this when they were put in solitary confinement. So I could continue with East Germany, but why don't we leave it, why don't we leave it at West Germany? I have a question, then I see there's a question in the back. So what I find found interesting was uh, the contrast between the Schmidt administration and the Merkel administration. Because imagine there is a larger um, uh, uh, occurrence of, uh, occurrence of, of uh, mass violence. And uh, Chancellor Scholz would say, this, that, that's not our beer. That's something you can't say anymore. So where do you see the inflection point? So when exactly does it change? Why does it change? Also the, the kind of parlance uh, German politicians and administrations use to, to address uh, these kinds of issues? Well, your question made me realize that I did not exactly respond to your question, which was when, I think, yeah, there was a final part to it, right? Which was when did those feelings of guilt actually start to be motivational in the way I described today? 
Um, <clears throat> Well, I, I think there's, you know, begins with Vili Pont in 6970, this more emotional um, identification with and, 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 um, and, and, and coping with uh, the, um, uh, the past. So that really is, um, you know, really a turning point. But doing, say, volunteer work abroad, that already begins in both German states in the 1950s. There was already then this sense of, wanting to become citizens of the world. How much of that reflects feelings of guilt because of what happened? How much of it reflects just wanting to get out of Germany and go see something else? You know, hard, hard to say. Remind me quickly, what, did that respond also to your, no? No, I would, I would put the, the effort, uh, the, the emphasis a little bit more also on the, public and and state side of things. So as, as I said, I, I imagine there is something big happening and Scholz uh, is, is um, uh, heading the Bundespressekonferenz and just says, we don't care. We, we just don't care. Uh, you can't say that anymore, right? Uh, so what and when exactly uh, do these things change? Right. Um, Well, already, I mean, I mean, you're right. I mean, Schmidt may be the last of his generation in a sense. If you listen to his, uh, he was the first West German chancellor of Auschwitz. In his five-minute speech, there's not, this is in 1977, I think, or 78, not one mention of Jews and Hitler's first victims he describes as, as, the, uh, as, as the Germans. I mean, you know, the 80s is seen as this period, this, this fighting between, you know, this conservative Nolte on the, on the one hand and the Habermas and, and the liberals on the other. But I, 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 I guess, you know, it's, it's tough to determine a specific turning point, but I, I would think the Weizsäcker speech in 1985, after that, um, I, I think there's much less of a willingness to you know, say things like, like um, you know, Schmidt said. But he said that to me in 2007 or 2008, along with some other very questionable things. But, um, okay. Do you? Um, the, in, the, in the very back? Hello, uh, thank you for the interesting talk at first. Uh, I wanted to ask how you perceived or how do you perceive um, the difference in Germany um, between the public remembrance culture of the Holocaust compared to the, like in the public sphere compared to the private sphere? Um, because I've been talking about this with my German friends a lot lately that we feel while in the Holocaust is such an integral part of public memory or collective memory in Germany. People are still very hesitant to talk about their family histories and guilt of their fa own family members regarding the Holocaust. So, for example, in German high schools, you will talk about the Holocaust every year. But when it comes to your own family members or family members or friends, you only know stories of, yeah, you feel like all of a sudden, everybody had family members in the resistance movement. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I wanted to ask, how did you perceive this in your research? Um, it's, it's not really something that came up much in my research, but I can offer you a very interesting statistic I recently found, uh, which confirms what you're saying. Uh, I forget what year, it was pretty recent, and Germans were asked um, if they thought Oh, you, you know the whether or not your your family were victims, or, no, part of the resistance or perpetrators. And I think one percent thought perpetrators, and thirty percent thought victims. So, um, you know, it's it, it, it's hard to generalize with questions like that. You know, I, Maybe it was the German circles I was in from the beginning, but there was always a great willingness to to talk about uh, that past. And uh, um, but you know, on the part of others, right, much much more uh, no no desire. So you know, I really hate to talk about the Germans, and and even there, you know, comparing official, even that's nuanced, and 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 um, you know what people are saying, you know, saying well, what the Germans call the you know the Volkszähler. Thanks. 
Um, so in the Netherlands, we have a lawsuit going on uh, to the Dutch state for the weapon transfers to Israel. And I was wondering how the German guild um, of Holocaust contributes to their um, policy in arm transfers and stuff like that. Yeah, well, <clears throat> the, the weasel response to this is, my book is about the 1970s to the 1990s, so I'm not going to field questions about today. Um, but, you know, as you know, there's been a great deal of debate about this, um, you know, with claims especially um, by um, progressive American public intellectuals, Susan Nyman, Naomi Klein. Didn't know she was an expert on German memory culture, but apparently she is. I guess she read Gisa, Masha Giesen's piece or something because she said the exact same things. Um, I, um, I, I think it's different. I mean, I think one understands why the Germans, why officials are respond in the way that they do to um, to protest that it is perceived to be somehow anti-Semitic or calling for violence, right? Pro-Palestinian protest that is interpreted that way. And I'm sure mistakes are made sometimes. And, and you know, they, they repress voices, you know, people who are standing there peacefully. You know, there are stories of uh, Jews living in Germany who have, who have uh, protested against Israeli policy and, and cracked down on them. Um, you know, it's not my job to... <laughs> To, to defend uh, Germans, but as an observer, I'd say, you know, and this is what came up over and over again in my, uh, in my research when looking at how other countries respond to them, the Germans are damned if they do and damned if they don't. If they didn't respond to some of the protests that have been taking place, one can imagine what the international, you know, reaction would have been, would have been to that. Here? Yeah. Oh. Well, you just said you wouldn't comment on modern day uh, occurrences. I'm not sure if you can answer this, but I had a question uh, regarding the persecution of the Yazidis in Syria and Lebanon. Uh, only two criminals were brought to international court in Germany as well. So uh, what else can we as an international community do to raise awareness and learn from the genocide of these religious minorities and um, aid in their displacement, which has not been like, fully reconciled? Well, you know, I, I appreciate the question. Um, and of course it's related to what I'm talking about tonight, but it's, you know, it's very... You know, it's very difficult for me to, you know, respond in a should, what should they do or, or, or not. We all have, I'm sure, you know, useful ideas. Um, but what I, what I will say based on my research is this. I was astounded by, this, maybe I was naive, but I was astounded by how much the, the daily media influenced the conversation, um, you know, mainly on the part of officials and, and, and others, so... So I think the media plays an important role in all of this. In the middle. The, the gentleman in the middle. Yeah. Well, first, thank you for your talk. Um, I have two questions. The first is that uh, uh, the you made in very interesting uh, remark about uh, uh, the Vergangenheit uh, uh, bewältigung uh, between Eastern and Western Germany, and that is, uh, uh, I think that's right, but uh, the state uh, of Eastern Germany has completely other, the Vergangenheitsbewältigung has started then, in fact, in the 90s, and not before. And that, that's one thing I, uh, uh, I like to, uh, uh, yeah, I like to point out. That's one thing. Second thing, you made a remark about victims 
and I'm, I'm Jewish. I've been 40 years uh, together uh, with an Eastern German, if, uh, Eastern German fugitive, and uh, uh, that is completely different uh, the, the way, no, let's say it another way, uh, what's important is uh, we had to make our own history and that's what you said about uh, personal history and common history and, and, and the, that difference is uh, the, the history we had is a completely different history uh, 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 of the official history. And uh, there are always similarities, that, that's completely true, but at the other hand, it is, uh, uh, we never felt we were born after the war, uh, after the Second World War, uh, uh, we never have been felt as victims. And that's one of the things, uh, what I think is very important to emphasize, that uh, uh, our generation, and I'm 70 now, uh, 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 is, we have a history, but we are not victims. And if you call us, uh, we you maybe you, you didn't mention that that exactly, but victimizing people of our generation is, I think, not the right thing to do so. So I, I'm I'm just curious about your reaction about that. It's a it's a very open question. I know I realize it's also an emotional question, so so it is. Uh, uh, it, it's not. A, it's not a statement of that. Okay. <clears throat> I, I'm going to respond first, and um, probably mainly to your first question, which, which was about how East Germans dealt with the uh, with the Nazi past, and um, what you said about it really only beginning there in the 1990s. That's the prevalent image in the West, um, and it's not true. It's misleading. You know, the first film, for example, ever made that more than obliquely dealt with with, with the genocide of the the European Jews was a film made in you know in East Germany and in, in East Berlin. Um, now it is true that in the hierarchy of victims, Jews were. You know, they came after workers and 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 and, and communists, um, and then, you know, beginning in the early '50s when Stalin, you know, this new anti-Semitic phase uh, and and uh, begins that aligns very nicely with the Cold War struggle in the Middle East starts. You know, the Soviet bloc starts uh, cozying up to. Uh, to to the Arab states in the in the Middle East, and there, you know, you you you. Um, the Jews are even probably given less attention, right? Okay. Um, but, you know, in my own research, I, I was struck by the fact the, the Germans who wrote, who, who covered, say, the carnage in Cambodia, saw wonderful documentary films that were made by these two, uh, Hainovsky and, um, oh, no. How an S studio? Okay, Shoyaman, Shoyaman, Hanovsky and Shoyaman. Um, the language and the imagery that was used was was really steeped in Holocaust imagery. The, the type, and you know, it depend. It had a lot to do with who was covering this. For example, um, the journalist from Neues Deutschland was a German, uh, a, a, a German Jew who came from a communist um, um, family, but. You know, if, if this idea that the East Germans didn't didn't discover the Holocaust until 1990, um, the first statement that the freely elected People's Chamber uh, adopted in March of 1990, its very first statement was was an apology 
for what the Germans and the GDR had done to the Jews. So clearly, you know, it just didn't appear over, you know, just overnight. Um, yes, hello. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very uh, insightful. I would have uh, one question as, your, um, yeah, as, as you were mainly researching the foreign policy and the development of the foreign policy uh, regarding genocide. I was interested uh, whether you have um, come across uh, of discrepancies between um, how to approach genocidal questions uh, in foreign policy towards um, policies that was uh, happening inside of Germany, like um, framing German identity, thinking about Rostock Lichtenhagen. Um, so there were a lot of rising of the far right during the 90s, especially in Germany, while maybe um, the questions in foreign policy might have been dealt different, uh, differently. I don't know. So that would be my question, whether you um, have um, dealt with some of differences in your research. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you put your finger on an important point, and, and this is something that German officials and journalists uh, mentioned as well. This, this outpouring of generosity toward refugees from for, for, former Yugoslavia was the exact counterpoint to these awful stories from the early 90s of these pogroms and burning of refugee homes and attacks and... and um, you know, and I would quickly add, there was a sense that that was uh, more common in East Germany, and perhaps uh, it was. I, I don't know the, the statistics offhand, but you know, I, I'm always amazed at how often, especially West Germans, forget how many of those terrible attacks took uh, took place in the West too. So. Thanks. Um, you. You mentioned um, really briefly the uh, relationship or the policies uh, towards the uh, genocides in Rwanda, but didn't say much, or or maybe I missed it, uh, that they, you just said they didn't lift a finger, right? right? Yes. And d did I understand, well, that's because of their colonial relationship? No. Oh, no. then I could. Oh. Why? <laughs> Why didn't they lift a finger, right? Well, nobody lifted a finger. I mean, that, 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 that's, you know, part of the answer. But, um, yeah. I think, you know, you're right. I, I did not cover, I didn't talk much about the response to Rwanda, and it's the, there's only one chapter in the book on it, and the others are all devoted to Bosnia and, and, uh, and Cambodia. Um, they, they, um, certainly reported about it. Cole and Kinkel, the chancellor and the, and the foreign minister, I believe were the first Europeans to actually use the term genocide to describe this, which I always found strange because the Germans as an early signatory of the UN Genocide Convention, you know, certain things devolve upon them as a result of, you know, and, and, and other states. Um, and I was always amazed at the alacrity with which they officials, and also true for Bosnia, it was also Kinko and Cole who first among the Europeans referred to it as a, as a genocide. Um, but there's no sense that there's any, anything that you're supposed to do, even though you're a signatory, right, of, of, of this, uh, um, you know, uh, of this uh, international treaty. And never really a discussion at all about whether the fact that it was genocide, because, you know, for legal reasons, if they had to do something. So it was always, the, the main debate was not so much about whether or not these three events or others have been genocide, um, but more about whether it's appropriate to compare the Holocaust uh, to, uh, to them. Now, Rwanda, very quickly, uh, there was a sense that it was much, well, the distance was, of course, much greater, just like Cambodia. It was seen as culturally, you know, far away. Uh, geographically, of course, of, of course, as well, um, there were claims that the German government was especially resistant to allowing in Rwandan refugees, 
and the claim was that, that that had to do with racist reasons because they were because they were Africans. So it was a theme. I can't I can't judge whether or not that was why you know German officials were deciding as they were, but that was something an accusation that came up. I'm not an academic, <laughs> but I have a question, something that troubles my mind. I'm a 68-year-old daughter of a refugee, Jewish def refugee from Berlin. He was from 1910. He was here early in 1933 because he, was, he had to go because he was a left-wing student activist. Um, but I have, I have this question about... He was very impressed um, with what was going on how the how the Germans in the 70s took up uh, this whole guilt thing, and he was glued to the television. Um, um, uh, he also had many he had did many talks about the Holocaust in schools and things like that. Now I have also a question because of all the things that are happening now again. How did the Germans like uh, like? of a city of Dresden that was uh, like, I think that even Churchill's wife said it was actually a crime of uh, a war, a war, say, a crime of war. <laughs> and they just went over the top. How did the Germans of Dresden come to terms with that? And um, yeah, maybe there are now different re reactions I know coming up again. But um, maybe can we learn something about that and what's going on like in Gaza? <laughs> um, okay. Well, I'm going to leave the Gaza uh, <laughs> part out. Um, no, 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 I, I, I understand. Um, Sorry, I'm. Re <clears throat> yeah, could you? You want to? Do you want to? You just summarize it very quickly. Just give me a. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Despite how impressive it was, how how the Germans or or maybe the West Germans in the from the seventies dealt with their guilt, yeah. even sometimes, maybe even over the top, sometimes very heavily. Yeah. Um, how did people from cities that were Addressing, bombed, yeah. like yeah. Dresden, yeah. come yeah. That to was terms a with it? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to blame jet lag one more time for <laughs> um, So it would be very interesting to do a regional study like that and see if you know in the local papers in Dresden, if they drew that you know comparison more frequently, but there was very often uh, in these debates talk about German experiences, those who were opposed to participating in any way in the bombing of Serb cities or, or Serb locations in Bosnia. Um, there was talk, you know, especially old Germans of an older generation would say, you know, we can't abide that. I remember what it was like as a child to, to be a bomb. So I could imagine in a place like uh, Dresden, um, and, you know, a city like Rotterdam here, that those kinds of, um, you know, comparisons were more readily made. Okay. Okay. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. So uh, let's uh, thank Andrew for his talk. Thank you for coming. Have a good night. Bye.